There we introduce uh, Sebastian Grau, who will be teaching the second part of this, uh, this course. So, um, before I leave the word to him, uh, a small change in the program for today because this room is taken after 2 o'clock. So, Sebastian will try to finish, finish by 2. Yeah. yeah, do my so best. We didn't find any other rooms close by, so that's it. But uh, yeah, there is more time tomorrow, so I think you'll, mm. you'll catch up. So with that, mm. I'll just cool. leave, 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 <laughs> leave the floor here. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, so welcome. Um, I will give you a series of lectures on uh, optimal control. Um, and before I go into this kind of stuff, uh, I just want to give you a bit of heads up on convex optimization. So it's not, it's not the topic of the course, but uh, it's probably good to remind you a few things uh, on, uh, on what is convex. Um, so these slides are not really mine. The rest is uh, it's adapted from stuff I stole from colleagues. Um, so who has been or is working with convex optimization, by the way? A little bit, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so people really like convex optimization because if your problem is convex, a lot of things uh, become simpler. And I will try to uh, explain that a tiny bit uh, in these slides. Uh, but before getting there, I will just give you a bit of a few definitions and, uh, and heads up on, uh, on what is uh, what we mean by convex uh, optimization and convex problems. Um, yeah. uh, we're supposed to stop at 11, is that correct? Or uh, is there usually a break from uh, uh, half now? Yeah. Full <laughs> hour. At hour. around yeah. at uh, 10, 15 or? Yeah. Break, yeah, okay. And then, yeah. yeah. So Okay. Uh, all right. So the first thing would be convex sets. It's a very simple thing to visualize. Uh, essentially, a set is convex if any two points you would pick in the set, you can draw a line between the two points, and that line is in the set. So that's convex. You can pick any points and draw lines. This is non-convex. You can pick these two points, and uh, this line exits the set on the way. And this is not convex because uh, by these things, uh, we mean that, for example, these points are not part of the set and these uh, thick lines would be part of the set. So if you pick two points here, the line would exit the set here. Uh, and you can formally define this really by just saying uh, for any two points, x1, x2, and any lambda between 0 and 1, so it's like just generate the segment between the two points, uh, you want this segment to be in the set. So fairly simple uh, definition. Uh, it's easy to visualize that on uh, on this kind of sets. You know, if you think in one million dimensions or uh, on slightly exotic sets, it can become quickly a bit hard to see if it's convex or not. So at some point, you may have to rely on this kind of formal definition to check uh, what is going on. Um, maybe just a head up, more on the intuition level. Uh, why do we like convex sets in optimization? Uh, essentially because uh, when you work in optimization, you, you will move in your, in your sets uh, and try to explore points. And what you know essentially if it's convex is that if you go from one point to another in the set, you'll be always in the set. So you can kind of move in between points in the set without taking the risk of leaving the set. If it's non-convex and you have this point and that point, you can actually not like, travel between these points uh, without leaving the set. You have to go around. Uh, around this uh, this thing here and uh, essentially anything that anytime you can move along a line you're essentially talking about linear algebra that's what you're doing uh, as soon as you have to go around obstacles it's uh, something more complex just a head up of why uh, convexity may be important another example of a convex set that's the convex cone uh, the set does not need to be closed for example that's a convex cone, so essentially all the points starting at zero and going all the way to infinity. Uh, that's, uh, that's a convex set called a convex cone. So you can build it, uh, for example, from two points here uh, by doing linear combinations uh, of these two points with uh, positive parameters that would generate this full, uh, full like slice. 
uh, convex hull. That's uh, a notion that is used a lot. You may have heard it in, uh, in Sasha's lectures, possibly. Uh, essentially, that's the idea. It's easy, easier to visualize if you get a, or if I give you a cloud of points, you could build a convex hull of these points. That's essentially what is the, the smallest uh, convex set that uh, would enclose all the points. That would be this thing, for example. Um, and you can generate it by essentially building all the convex uh, combinations of the points. So basically a sum, or weighted sum of all the points you have in your cloud um, with uh, this coefficient summing up to one and being positive. So that would generate these things. Uh, convex hulls are used a lot in, uh, in optimization and also in data processing and all these things. And it does not stop at a, uh, at a finite uh, set of points. Uh, if you had this non-convex set here, because of this bulb here, you could build a convex hull by essentially uh, joining more stuff to the set to make it convex. So you could do that. Essentially the same idea as here, but now you have essentially an infinite, you know, infinitely many points uh, to play with. You can stop me at any time eh, if you have a question or a concern or something is unclear. <coughs> uh, hyperplanes, half space. Um, here is a hyperplane, essentially defined by all the points orthogonal to a vector in some sense, or for which uh, the scalar product is, uh, is constant. So that would be an example. Essentially, uh, if you're working in two dimensions, that would be defining a line. And if you're working in higher dimensions, you're basically, for example, in 3D, building a, a plane that is orthogonal uh, to uh, a given vector. And the B is kind of moving that plane around in space. Um, yeah. And if you go for to the half space, it's kind of basically the same thing, but now you, you will include all the points that are on one side of that object. So if you have this for the equality, the inequality will give you one side of that, okay? And these are convex sets. Uh, as long as you do something like this, you're defining something convex. Mm -hmm. Okay, and from these things, you can build one of the uh, fundamental object in uh, optimization, at least in convex optimization, polytopes. Essentially look like this. <coughs> it's essentially like enclosing uh, a space uh, between um, um, this uh, this uh, half spaces. Uh, so if you have a set of these half spaces and each of them allows only one side, then the intersection of all this will give you uh, a, a polytope. Uh, the polyhedron is essentially the same thing, but if it's open, you may have uh, points going to infinity. Uh, yeah, that's what the polyhedron is. So many problems uh, will be using polytopes to define which points you can accept as solutions to <coughs> an optimization problem. And these are convex sets, so these are things uh, we like to play with. Any question with that? All good? Huh? Okay. And now what people do in convex optimization or when discussing convex problems is you have definitions of convexity, but they are often a bit annoying to use and complex. So what people do is they try to, uh, to have in mind what are the operations that preserve convexity. So if I have a convex set and transform it through some operations, is the resulting uh, set convex. For example, if I transform a function via these operations, will I preserve convexity? So you, like people working a lot with uh, convex optimization, they kind of know these things by heart more or less and kind of know it as if it was algebra that if they do some transformations, they would keep convexity. So that's what uh, I'm talking about here, operations that preserve convexity on sets. I'm talking about sets so far. Uh, here is an example. Uh, if you intersect two convex sets, uh, you get a convex set. So if you can imagine uh, you build this intersection of two convex sets. Uh, the, inter oops. the intersection will be convex. Um, 
if you were to do the union of two convex sets, that would not be a convex set, right? If, you, if I take the union of these two convex sets here, I get this entire thing here. And you can see, for example, up here, that you don't have a convex set, right? So be a bit careful when you um, when you do operations on, on convex objects. They are like simple operations uh, that uh, that destroy convexity. Any time, pretty much, as a general rule, that you do a linear or a fine transformation on objects, you will preserve convexity. For example, um, if you take um, the set of points in S and apply some affine operation on them. So that gives you a new set. Uh, this new set will still be convex. And you can think about that. It's fairly intuitive in some sense because the fine operations will essentially um, move your set around and kind of reshape it, but always uh, in a linear way. So you may turn that thing into maybe uh, something like a novel or anything, but you will never create like some kind of bulbs in it, for example, right? So when you do an affine transformation of your set, uh, the outcome cannot be non-convex if you started from a convex set. Uh, same if uh, you do the operation the other way around, right? Uh, the pre-image, if you revert that affine operation, it will still be uh, a convex set. So if you start from that convex set and uh, go back to the original set. If this thing is convex, that one is convex as well. And uh, so these things are possibly fairly obvious in some sense, but if you understand them well enough, you can, uh, you can uh, see the convexity of <coughs> things that are not necessarily obvious. Here is an example. Uh, Let's assume I build uh, the set of X, so X has four components, and I want to pick all the X's such that this polynomial is positive for any value of T between zero and one. Okay, well, is that set convex? Well, okay, that's maybe not completely obvious to see if you don't fully understand these convexity rules. Uh, but if you understand them, it's fairly easy to see. Huh? Because essentially, for any t that you want to pick between 0 and 1, uh, you're essentially describing uh, an affine operation on x, and uh, that, th that thing has to be greater than 0. So you're essentially describing a half space. So a half space is convex, right? And now uh, you want these to hold for every t, so you want all the intersection of all the half spaces you build for any t, uh, and that's the set you're describing. So you're essentially building an intersection of convex sets, right? According to the rules we've seen before, that is supposed to be convex, right? So applying these simple rules that visually are kind of, hopefully kind of obvious, um, you can actually discuss fairly uh, strange objects and uh, conclude about their convexity or non-convexity fairly easily, okay? few more examples, um, for example, this is, uh, do you understand this kind of notations? No problem with that, it's a two norm. So that's a ball on W. So this is convex, huh? if, it, if you build a ball, and you, then you take a fine transformation on that, you get a convex set anyway. And what's happening there is really that uh, your W norm less than one is, is like a ball in whichever dimension you are, and the fine transformation is doing that and vice versa. That's maybe less obvious, but if <coughs> you want AX plus B to be inside that ball, then the set of X that respects that is also convex. That's an example. Huh? Uh, that's a transformation of the ball. It could be a bit ellipsoidal, for example. Okay with that? Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is that you're not bound to work with the uh, the very classic vector space, like something in Rn. Uh, here is an example of another vector space, uh, symmetric matrices. You can check that it's a vector space. Uh, and this is an object that many people uh, do optimization with, and that's 
quite interesting to uh, understand that. So that's a, that's a, uh, a set, and that's actually a vector space. We define um, this kind of symbols. Most often, actually, people in the literature, they would not use this rounded thing. They would just use a classic inequality. But when we apply that to a matrix, what we mean is that all eigenvalues are non-negative, uh, which also means that uh, any quadratic form that you want to build with that matrix is positive, right? Classic stuff. Uh, if you apply a strict inequality, uh, you essentially want all eigenvalues to be strictly positive. The quadratic forms would be strictly positive. <coughs> and then from that, you can build a set of positive definite symmet symmetric matrices. Essentially, you want the matrix to be symmetric with positive. So all the eigenvalues will be real, and you want them to be uh, positive. And that set is convex. That's, uh, that's the good news. Uh, which means you can do optimization on this kind of set fairly easily. Um, yeah, that's a sketch of proof. Uh, <coughs> it's a bit the same story as before. If you had to prove the convexity of that, uh, you may scratch your head for a little bit. But actually, if you work with the quadratic forms, and a bit the same ideas as in the polynomial example before, uh, it's not so hard. So you can pick any z and build a quadratic form. And this may not be completely obvious, but this is linear in, in x, is if z is chosen. Uh, you could rewrite it as a sum or linear combination of the x's. Uh, so that's a half space in this funny uh, if, uh, vector space. Um, and so if you describe your set of uh, positive definite uh, matrices, you could also say, well, I want that the quadratic forms for all these matrices are positive for all the z's. It's kind of saying the same thing as this. And uh, so for any z, this is, for a given z, this is um, a half space. And then I want this to be true for all of these z's. So I'm intersecting all these half spaces. So I have a convex set, right? So you can apply high level rules to. Um, to see that the set is convex. You're good with that? Uh, doing optimization with uh, positive semi-definite matrices, it's very common because it's capturing a lot of problems that people actually need to solve in practice, uh, including uh, problems in robust optimization, as you may have uh, seen a bit with Sasha. OK, convex sets, that's one thing. Uh, the convex sets in convex optimization will be describing what point we can accept as, uh, as part of our solution. And then we'll have convex functions, uh, kind of dependent of convex sets. In convex optimization, you will have convex functions as cost functions, the, the objective you want to minimize. Um, and uh, if you have both a convex set and a convex cost function, you have a co convex problem. So it's so good to discuss what uh, convex functions are. Um, it's kind of the same story as convex sets, um, and they are like very strong connections, obviously. Uh, but roughly speaking, uh, again, best is a picture. Here is a convex function. It's convex because if I pick two points on the function and I draw a line between them, the line is above the function, right? So very visual and easy to see. Uh, a more formal definition that you can apply if visually it's not obvious um, or you cannot build a visualization often uh, is essentially describing the same thing uh, in a formula. So essentially uh, this is uh, describing the segment between those two points, right? So you do a linear combination between f of x and f of y using this lambda, 1 minus lambda. And then this is describing the function in between. And you want it to be below or at the same level as the line. So if the function was doing that here, that would be acceptable. OK with that? Same story as before. Um, um, you can distinguish between convex and strictly convex. Actually, we didn't see that for the sets. Uh, but um, so if you have the. Uh, um, this type of inequality, then it's convex. If it's strict inequality, uh, then you, you talk about strictly convex functions. 
Um, and sometimes it's important to distinguish between just convex and strictly convex, especially when it comes to uh, using numerics. Um, you can like torture around this, uh, this condition quite a bit. Uh, one uh, thing you can uh, uh, see is that uh, if the function is differentiable, it may not be. Uh, you may have functions that uh, are not necessarily differentiable, but still convex. That would be an example here, it's not differentiable. Uh, but it's if the fu function is uh, uh, differentiable and convex, uh, then you have this so-called underestimator um, property. Essentially, if you take any point on the, f on the function and build its linear approximation, so basically uh, build a tangent around that point. If the function is convex, uh, then it will be above or at this approximation, right? So if it's strictly convex, it would be strictly above and um, otherwise uh, it may actually be on that approximator for a bit. Uh, this kind of property is used a lot, again, because it's uh, like an under uh, underestimator or under approximation of the function. You know the function is above, so you can uh, say a number of things about uh, what the function will do uh, around that point. And actually, it's, it's a global, huh? so even if you go far away, and even though this is an approximation, uh, you would still have this property that the function is above. So it's kind of saying something important about the function. Okay with that? Uh, second order condition, uh, that's used a lot actually when you have uh, like su sufficiently smooth functions like at least twice differentiable. Um, you would be able to use this kind of condition essentially simply that the Hessian of the function is positive definite. So essentially, locally, your <coughs> function is curved up, right? It's as simple as that. Uh, <coughs> but uh, it, it stops to apply as soon as the function is non-differentiable. Like for example, this one, uh, you cannot apply this kind of uh, notion at this point. So then you have to, uh, to go back to actually this kind of definition before, typically or to look at it as uh, an operation on convex functions. A few examples, um, an exponential function um, is convex. And maybe that's interesting just to mention that uh, it's easy to think about convexity mostly uh, by imagining simply quadratic functions or something that looks like that, but it goes beyond that. So the exponential function that is uh, this thing here uh, it doesn't look like a, like a quadratic function, but it's still convex by all definitions. Also, powers of the variable x um, would be convex. If the power is uh, larger than 1 and less than 0, and that's... Uh, Maybe not obvious. I mean, this is not a convex function, but just be careful that we restrict it for x positive. So if you look only on the positive side, then it actually works. Um, other types of function, negative logarithm minus log x, that's a convex function. Do you know why it's useful, this function in optimization? No. Uh, it's used actually, we'll actually see that in, uh, in a bit later in the course. Uh, it's useful to build so-called barrier functions. Uh, if you want, for example, x larger than zero in a problem, uh, you can uh, replace that by saying, I'll put a very large penalty on x uh, becoming negative. And you can do that by uh, using this kind of function. This will go to infinity as x approaches zero. So we'll see that uh, a bit later that you can uh, actually solve numerically optimization problem by using these kind of functions, throwing them in the cost, and it's convex, so it's uh, it's nice to work with. Uh, a few more examples: affine functions. Everything that is linear affine is convex, so that's good to work with. It's nice. Norms. Any kind of norm is convex including, for example, 
infinity norms. It's not obvious. Huh? Infinity norm, you take the max over the, all, all the absolute values of the elements. Uh, well, it's still convex. Uh, convex quadratic. Um, yeah, also if you build quadratic forms with, that's important, uh, the, the matrix you use in the, in the quadratic term, it has to be uh, positive definite, otherwise you're lost. Um, this is obvious, for example, and the Hessian of that function would be essentially 2B. Um, so if this matrix is positive definite, that's it. Okay with that? That's the same story as for sets. Uh, if, you, if I give you a function and ask, ask you to prove convexity, uh, you can apply the definitions, but uh, it may not be, be very helpful to, to build things in practice. So what is used by people most often when they want to uh, play with convexity and optimization, they rather think about this as uh, uh, how do I transform my function into convex function via operations? And if the operations preserve convexity, uh, then the function is convex, a bit like that. So if you transfer func transform functions um, that are convex in the right way, you'll keep something convex. For example, if you have a set of convex functions, these fj's, and you sum them using only positive weights, the alphas, uh, then the function you get uh, is convex. And that works um, even if you have an infinitely many functions, and even if you, if your sum is uh, is um, uh, uh, non-countable. So, actually, if your f of x this is also a sum in most possible ways, um, if this weighting here is positive and my function uh, f is uh, convex in x then yeah, let's call it j maybe then this function here will be convex as well right so it extends to infinite dimensional spaces but be careful with this huh? uh, this uh, there are lots of false friends in uh, in uh, in uh, convex optimization you may think that Oh, well, if I just sum up convex functions, it's probably going to be convex because it looks linear. So you may have like false intuitions like this, but you need your alphas to be, uh, to be uh, positive. A uh, very stupid example of that, let's say that I sum maybe a linear function and let's say a quadratic function, right? And uh, I will do, for example, 0 times f1 minus f2, right? Here I'm using a negative alpha. Well, then the outcome will be a concave function, right? So the alphas have to be positive. Again, um, same story as before. Huh? When you do purely affine operations, it's usually uh, okay. So, for example, if you have a convex function g and you do an, aff an affine transformation inside, it will not destroy convexity. All right, that's a good one. Um, that's not obvious at all, I would say. Uh, if you take a set of convex functions, f1 to fm, and then you basically, like, you could walk through your function, through your x's, and at every x, you take the max over all these functions, right? It's a very nasty operation. If you do that, the outcome is still convex. That's quite cool. Um, maybe if I make an illustration of that. Let's see if I try to find something. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, why not? Let's see. So here, I have two convex functions, right? F1, F2. And if I take the pointwise maximum, I will be doing... I guess you maybe see it coming. Okay, no more chalk. Uh, I would basically, at every point, take the, the, higher, the highest function. So I'll be uh, building that function here. 
right? Uh, if you take the pointwise minimum, that's not the same. I'll be taking this, and this is not the convex function here, right? Um, yeah, that's another one that is used also in many problems. Um, <coughs> so if this function g is convex on every variable, both x and u, and then you take the infimum. If you don't like infimums, just think of the mean of u. So if you take the, the minimum of g uh, for a given x over u, the function you get out of that is also convex. Uh, so that's useful. It would not work with a supremum. So yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. So this one is often used. Um, so if G is convex uh, and its uh, image is a scalar, and then you apply uh, another function H that is not usually non-decreasing. <laughs> Always struggle with that word. Uh, then you're good to go. Uh, it's gonna be convex. Um, yeah, one thing that may be not completely intuitive, if you compose convex functions, there is no guarantee a priori that you'll be, uh, yeah, that you will get a convex outcome. A few examples, um, this is convex, right, oops. Uh, you take basically an affine function inside a convex function, like uh, that's a norm, so it's convex. Uh, this would be convex. Yeah, that's a very useful one. It's actually coming from uh, this uh, non-negative sum here. Uh, you could read this as an expectation, right? It's different probabilities alpha over different outcome f. You could extend that in, uh, in an integral and you basically have uh, an expected value. So if your g is convex uh, in, mm, should be 4x. Uh, should check that. But essentially you can form expected values on convex functions and still get something convex. Uh, so that's very useful when you work with uh, probability, probability distributions. Um, yeah, this point was maximum. It's useful, for example, in, in uh, robust optimization. Uh, when you do these things, you're essentially looking at the worst case scenario. So. You could think of your W as some, uh, some, like say, uncertain quantity in your problem, and X would be the variables that uh, you need to optimize over. And then you, essentially, this could be, for example, a, uh, a, a quantity that cannot exceed some threshold in the problem, and then you want to find the worst case. So over all the, uh, the uncertainty W, say, bounded by something, I want the max uh, to, for example, be less than some value. So that's th this kind of construction arises in that context. Uh, and you can transform that into that. It's not obvious to do that, uh, but you can do it. Um, and but then the outcome is convex. So people use that a lot, for example, for doing a robust uh, optimization on linear programs, for example. Um, yeah, that's also used a lot more in control. Um, this is uh, essentially an LQR problem. Huh? Um, essentially, find the control U that minimizes this form for a given state X. That's the kind of problem uh, you get in, uh, in control. Uh, the outcome of this is the show complement. So I don't know if you recognize this kind of form here. It's good to, uh, it pops up whenever you do optimization, typically. Uh, and this transformation is, uh, is convex if, uh, if this matrix is positive definite. Uh, yeah, that's used a lot as well, the notion of sublevel set. Um, maybe I can make some picture as well. So sublevel set is the definition here. So essentially, try to pick all the points where the function is lower than some threshold. And um, I can make a 1D picture, for example. Um, uh, that's my function f. And if I pick a level c, now I'll check uh, where is my function 
lower than C. And here I will get uh, this set, right? Okay. Um, yeah, that's a sub-level set. Um, and here I actually just drew a counterexample to the theorem. Uh, my function f is non-convex because of this uh, bulb here. And the sub-level set at this c is non-convex as well, right? This set is non-convex. If I pick a point here and a point there, the segment will leave the set, right? Um, if the function is convex, for example, that one, why not? I draw a sub-level set, will be convex, right? You can picture that maybe if you think in uh, 3D, um, you think of a quadratic form in 3D, right? And you clip it at some level, what do you get? Sorry. Yeah, an ellipsoid. Yeah, right, you see that? And the ellipsoid is convex, right? So the quadratic form convex is convex, sublevel set ellipsoid is convex. Um, these things are quite useful because very often uh, we want to describe um, like the set of points we can accept in an optimization problem. And most often we describe this set of points in the form of inequalities, right? For example, I want uh, x squared to be less than 1, okay? And, and uh, when you do that, you're actually describing a set. And uh, it's, an, it's good to understand how the convexity of the function relates to the convexity of the set. So a few examples, uh, norm balls. So all the x at a distance uh, less or equal to r than some reference point xc. Um, under any kind of norm uh, we've seen before, uh, that's the, uh, uh, that's the uh, sublevel set of, uh, of that function. And that's convex. Yeah, I mentioned this one. Um, if you build a quadratic function with p positive definite, if p is positive definite, p minus 1 is as well. No? Uh, and then you build the sublevel set of that function, for example, for uh, c is 1. Uh, it's basically cutting your, uh, your quadratic form, and you get uh, an ellipsoid. And that's convex. Maybe less obvious objects. Uh, uh, if you describe the set of uh, points x of x and t, such that the norm of x is less than t, then you actually don't build a smooth object for a norm. Huh? Uh, this is actually the two norm square, or some kind of two norm square. As soon as you don't square the norm, for example, here the two norm, then uh, then you get something pointed that is not uh, smooth. Uh, but that's also a, uh, a convex set. You okay with that? Yeah? Okay. There was a lot of definition and, and, uh, and slightly abstract concepts. Uh, but these things are very useful when you build an optimization problem. Um, again, I'll talk more about that, but uh, if everything you throw into your optimization is convex, uh, then you have a very nice problem. Uh, nowadays, people tend to consider convex problems as, as trivial to solve. It's not true, but um, it's getting there. Um, and um, maybe just as a practical observation, um, if you cannot build a convex problem that uh, represents the, the things you want to work with, it does not mean that you should abandon uh, any convexification of what you have. So, for example, if some of your constraints are non-convex uh, and your uh, cost function is non-convex, uh, if you can, for example, make your cost function convex and accept the constraints as they are, you're still in a better position than um, having everything non-convex. But put more simply, the more convex you can make your problem, the better. It does not matter if uh, some stuff, you should not think, oh, s some stuff is not convex anyway, so I should not do any effort on the rest. You should still do it if possible. Okay. Okay, optimization problem. We would call that an NLP nonlinear program. It's made of the co uh, cost function, uh, phi, 
equality functions G and inequality uh, or equality constraints G, inequality constraints H. Uh, I'll stick to that notation throughout the, the notes so, or the, le the lecture, so uh, that should be good. Uh, I'll use W for the decision variables. Typically, we will talk about uh, a simple vector space Rn, but it does not need to be, and many problems are there are better described in other vector spaces, uh, but that's a detail. So phi transforms w into uh, um, a scalar, so that's something you want to minimize. g is typically multidimensional h as well, and so essentially <coughs> what this thing is describing is a set of points that you can accept as solution, and that set of point c that ideally you want to be convex uh, would uh, accept only points for which the inequalities are satisfied. And if you also include the equalities, essentially you're describing uh, some specific uh, set of points where you can search for your solution. So it could look like this, for example. Um, that would be a case with only um, inequality, inequality constraints uh, that would build uh, here a convex set C, and that could be an objective function with a minimum here and the solution there, right? Any question on that? Okay. Um, here is a generic form for convex problems. Um, there is a bad news concerning, concerning um, equality constraints. Um, the only form of e equality constraints that will for sure give you a convex problem are affine ones. For example, something linear times, so linear function of the variables equals some constant. Anything different than that in the equality constraints will typically generate a non-convex problem. Um, so that's, that's a big, big limitation to uh, having convex problems. Very often, and when we play with optimal control, it's most often the case, we don't have uh, equality constraints, uh, linear equality constraints here. So we most often have uh, non-convex problems. But if you have that, if you're lucky enough to have that, uh, your problem is convex if that function is convex and the cost function is convex. Then you have a convex problem and you should be happy about that. But again, I should insist on that if you have non-linear equality constraints, but you see that you can make your uh, uh, inequality constraints convex, or that a, a good approximation of your real problem can survive with convex inequality constraints, you should do it, because you will uh, remove a part of the difficulty. Same here, if you can uh, make your cost function convex for your problem, you should do it, even if these things maybe are nonlinear, right? It will just help uh, if you make more things convex inside your problem. So why are those people so obsessed about convexity? Uh, that's just because of that. So when you solve a convex problem and you, you find a tentative solution for your problem, uh, you know that that solution will also be a global solution. And maybe I should, I'll come back to this more formally later. But um, what is going on here is simply that um, if you have a non-convex function and uh, you find a minimum, for example, by saying all oh, the gradient of the function is zero, so that looks like a minimum, it does not mean that you don't have something better somewhere else, right? And if you don't have a complete picture of that function, you can imagine <coughs> it's a function in thousands of variables, so it's hard to chart it, obviously. Uh, you have to survive with that kind of uh, um, ways of looking at the function, and uh, it's easy to miss other um, or better optimum somewhere than the one you have found. If you have a convex function and you rely on the same kind of arguments for trying to find your minimum, for example, the gradient of the function is zero, uh, <coughs> then you know you have found 
the best solution there is on the function. There will not be something else out there that is better. So that's just a sketch to uh, uh, let you understand uh, why this is important. But um, it's a generic statement, essentially. If you have a convex problem, you solve it and, um, and you're done. Uh, so convex problems are typically considered as easy, even though they are not always easy. And uh, you can get the global solution in polynomial time. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a very strong property in optimization. It's rarely the case that you can do that. Um, yeah. Any question on that? No? Okay, a few examples of convex problems that people use a lot. Uh, the most simple one is uh, linear programs. Uh, it's used a lot in economics, for example. Uh, and it's essentially that uh, everything in the, in the problem is uh, linear or fine. So you have uh, an objective function uh, that is uh, basically just a linear form on the variable x, some uh, inequality constraints that are fine, and of course you need a fine uh, equality constraints. And what you're basically describing when you do that is a problem that looks like this, so a polytope, right? And your cost function is just like kind of a ramp that goes down somewhere. And the solution will, actually you can guess that from this sketch that the solution has to be under constraint, right? Your, your solution will basically si slide down the ramp until it's blocked by constraints, right? Actually, LPs, when you optimize, if you don't have a polytope as a feasible set, like if it was open, they typically don't have a solution because the point will keep sliding down, right? Yeah, that's an example of LP. Uh, if you minimize the one norm, it's essentially the sum of the, um, um, the absolute values of the components of that vector subject to some constraint. Uh, yeah, that's a very useful thing when you write an LP. Um, when you, so when you use the, this like um, uh, disciplined convex programming languages, um, you typically be able to write your uh, problem in this form, like or ax plus b, and I'll take the one norm, and the language will accept to read norm one of my function. But what is happening in the background that you don't see is that the the program or the the, the code will actually manipulate your problem a lot. So for example, if you ask to minimize the one norm of this thing, what will actually happen in the computer, the problem that will actually be solved is that one. And essentially it will keep the equality constraint, that's fine. But this is a non-smooth function and we don't like to work with that. So what the code will be doing, it will be basically trapping your AX plus B between uh, what we call slack variables. So you introduce more, more variables to handle the problem. And then it will minimize the sum of these slack variables. And if it's not obvious for you, you can take a bit of time offline to convince yourself that when you solve this, you actually solve that. And this is now, it's still, it's still a convex problem, right? It's inequality constraints on the fine forms and the linear objective function. Um, but now the functions I have described are smooth in the variables, even though I have inequalities, but the functions themselves are smooth. So that's an easy problem to solve numerically. Whereas this one is, uh, is terrible, actually. It's a non-smooth function, so it's not good. Uh, so yeah, just the reason why I bring this up is when you use uh, solvers that are not doing these transformations for you, like, for example, Cplex, uh, you want to do yourself these things to help your solver survive. So if you call solvers like IPOP, for example, don't throw one norm functions in there. You will really struggle with that. QPs, uh, used a lot in control and uh, optimal control. Uh, we'll go back to these things quite often. So it's the same as before, we just have here an extra quadratic term with H uh, positive definite. Um, so this problem is convex. If uh, it's 
positive definite, strictly convex if H is strictly positive definite. Be a little bit careful when you build QPs with uh, an H matrix that is not strictly positive definite. Uh, some solvers don't like that too much. It depends on the algorithmic behind. Um, QPs arise all the time in control. <coughs> That's what MPC is based on typically. Um, and there's one question that some people are not completely um, comfy with. Uh, why don't we use LPs in control? Do you have any idea? Yeah? You want to minimize the energy in the system? No, that's a good answer. Uh, there's something a bit more, uh, let's say not mathematical, but more uh, control based. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of probably normal that it's not obvious. It takes a little bit of thinking, but um, <coughs> let's see, just to make it, yeah, let's do it this way. I will come back to these notions later, but um, uh, if you think, for example, of LQR in control, right, what we like is typically that uh, at least at the very local level, uh, the input we give in the system is kind of proportional to how far we are from the reference, right? So if you're very far, you want to correct aggressively. If you're very close, you don't want to do too harsh corrections, right? And one of the reasons why you want to do that is, for example, uh, you always have a bit of sensor noise. So if you react like crazy to a small deviations from a target, you will just be reacting like crazy to noise. That's one reason for doing that. But there's also the energy argument that is related to that. If you minimize an energy function that is kind of locally quadratic, you'll end up with these things. Um, <coughs> so why do I bring this up? Very locally speaking, QPs they actually behave this way. They would give you an, uh, um, an outcome that is kind of uh, reacting linearly to how much you deviate from your reference. When you solve LPs, you have a very different reaction. If you have an LP, the reaction to deviations from a reference is actually bang bang. We'll see that a bit later in the course. Uh, which means if you're a little bit to the left of your target, you will turn the wheel completely to the right. If you're a bit to the right, you will turn it completely to the left. And it's not very hard to see that it's not a very good uh, behavior for a control system. So that's why people don't use LPs in control, yeah? So is the bang bang related to the one norm in the cost function? Is that what you consider an LP in control? Yeah, I would say uh, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the norm you have in an LP. So if you're a bit to the left, you essentially see that, oh God, the slope is, is I sh th that's the slope, I should go down here. If you go a bit to the right, that's the slope. And uh, the QP is using a quadratic penalty, which would look like this. So if you deviate a bit, you say, oh, you have a tiny bit of slope, but uh, it's not much, so I should not react too much. Yeah. So that's, that's a very good way of looking at the problem. Yeah. yeah, so LPs are not used much in control, or not at least not as a way of delivering uh, control inputs. You can use them in different, uh, for different reasons. Um, yeah, but they are used a lot anyway in many things, more like in scheduling of operations, for example, uh, economics, and so on and so forth. Uh, LPs are very easy to solve in the computer. You can have LPs with millions and millions of variables and uh, still solve it in decent times. Uh, also, MILPs, I'll not talk much about uh, mixed integer problems, like when you have discrete variables, but MILPs are also very cheap to solve, for example. So there are very, still very good tools to use. Okay. Uh, one level up. So I'm, I'm going from the simplest convex problems to the most complex ones. Uh, QCQPs, quadratically constrained quadratic programs. Uh, so now we moved a bit in complexity. Still uh, a fine uh, equality constraints. But uh, now I have also a quadratic constraint. 
And what this thing is describing is simply that uh, my set of physical points, again, and that's the sublevel set of a, of a quadratic function, so it's an ellipsoid. I want my points to be inside an ellipsoid. And I may have a quadratic function. So it could look like this. Uh, this would be the level curves of the cost. Minimum is here, and that's my uh, set of visible points described by this guy. And I didn't put an equality constraint in here. So the solution would be here. And that's convex, the same as the cost. Uh, if all these uh, uh, matrices building the quadratic forms are positive definite. So no surprise here. <coughs> QCQPs are also used in control, for example, to handle uh, terminal sets in MPC, for example. Right? I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, um, that's an example. It's also used in robust MPC, typically. Uh, ellipsoids would typically describe how the trajectories of the system may actually uh, uh, spread in time, like this tube-based MPC that you probably heard a lot about <laughs> with Sasha. Uh, they would typically use this kind of description uh, in the numerics. SOCP, second order cone programs. Uh, again, we change a little bit uh, the constraints. Now we introduce actually norms in there. So your uh, inequalities will start generating non-smooth uh, objects. Um, so that could look like this, for example, for one example of uh, what one of these inequality constraints can look like. So all the points above this cone would be uh, feasible. But we go back to a linear uh, objective function uh, in uh, classic SOCPs. Uh, okay, yeah. one example of SOCP, uh, when you solve robust LPs, mentioned that before. So a linear objective, and then you have this like kind of worst case uh, constraint. So it's again uh, describing, you could imagine that you want this to be satisfied. That's a linear or a fine inequality constraint for a given W, but you're not really sure on the W. It may, be, it may take different values. So to be sure, you take the worst case. So what is the worst case of this thing here for all the Ws inside, for example, a ball? And you want the constraint to be satisfied for this worst case. So you can turn this um, into um, an SOCP, essentially by uh, the transformation I showed before. Going from there to here is not completely obvious, uh, but uh, you can do that and then you get an SOCP. So that's, that's an example of why you meet this kind of problems. Uh, yeah, SDPs are used a lot in control as well. I don't know if you have uh, used them before. Robust control, it's used typically robust control design. Very useful stuff. So SDPs, I mentioned before, you, uh, we will mostly work, work on ve vector spaces, uh, the classic ones, the RN. Uh, but you can work on different types of vector spaces, for example, uh, symmetric matrices. Um, so the variables are still in Rn, but they will, uh, they will basically support the description of uh, matrix-based objects. For example, uh, you think of, uh, of a set of symmetric matrices, the Fs and the Gs, and you do a linear combination of them, and you want this thing to be positive definite. So you want all the eigenvalues of this sum of matrices to be positive, right? Uh, so it's called a linear matrix in it called the LMI. It's used in, in a number of applications. It's very useful. Um, yeah. Um, and that may sound like a very nasty problem. How do you optimize over eigenvalues of matrices? So if you take an eigenvalue and assess the, uh, uh, take a ma matrix and assess the eigenvalues. The relationship between the ma matrix entries and the eigenvalues, it's, it's a nightmare, right? You can uh, picture that probably. It turns out that these are convex problems, actually. Uh, an example of using this, you want to uh, minimize the maximum eigenvalue of a matrix. That's used a lot in a number of problems. Parameterized by x. Uh, so, for example, Mx is given by a uh, linear combination of these matrices. And you want to solve that problem. So it sounds very nasty, but you can formulate that as an SDP. 
essentially using kind of the same trick as the slack variables in the one norm. You introduce a t and you will say that ti minus a is positive definite. This is equivalent to saying that um, <coughs> or to minimizing uh, the eigenvalues of a. You can kind of verify that offline <coughs> if you want. So if you have optimization problems with eigenvalues in there, don't run away. Uh, you may be able to get away with an SDP, which is, I would not call it easy to solve. You often have uh, numerical difficulties, but uh, you have very good codes uh, solving SDP. So it's really worth trying. You want to take a break here? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you.